Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, tonight's class is a, a continuation on our last module on prayer. Um, so we're going to dive deep on uh, Catholic prayer tonight, Catholic prayer in particular, the weird way Catholics pray. That's the plan anyway. Uh, so we should start off with prayer then, shouldn't we? We should. <laughs> All right. All right. Put you on the spot mm -hmm. there. Well, we remember when Jesus' disciples asked Jesus, Lord, John the Baptist's disciples learned how to pray. Will you teach us how to pray? And that's when Jesus said, yes, when you pray, say. And so we will say the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples and his apostles. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but, but deliver, deliver us from evil. evil. Amen. 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 In the name Amen. of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You know, um, that way we start in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You want to talk about Catholic uh, particulars. <laughs> yeah. We seem to be about the only ones that do that. Uh, but as I understand it, that's uh, the way they certainly did it in the early church and especially in the middle ages they would make like a big shield you know make a big deal of it mm -hmm. um but it's the uh almost the shortest prayer and you know invoking the trinity exactly and then sometimes they make it with the three fingers together or the thumb and two fingers the orthodox do it backwards according to way we do it yeah. but uh but it is a belief in the trinity every time we make the sign of the cross it's a prayer in itself mm -hmm. yeah so when uh mama said when we passed uh drove by a catholic church we had the to sign make the, the sign of the cross so right but she never told us why <laughs> <laughs> oh because the jesus is present in the eucharist in that church yeah mm -hmm. yeah every, so every time passes mm -hmm. right Make the sign of the cross because mm -hmm. acknowledging the king is in the is in the uh, tabernacle there in the church. I'm sorry. You don't have to. You don't have you. You should. If the Eucharist is pressed in the tabernacle and you walk up the aisle and you see. Uh, mainly, you know, because of a sanctuary light that's nearby and there's a candle in there. And so if Jesus is present in the tabernacle, you kneel if you can, okay, or bow and then go into the pew. Uh, if you want to make the sign of the cross, fine. It's not obligatory. It's kind of like showing respect for Jesus being there. Right. Does it matter if you use your right or left hand? <laughs> uh, yes, it does. You, you, left hand. <laughs> you should use your right hand for making the sign of the cross. Okay. And it's just like when you kneel. I see people going down on their left knee. It should be on the right knee. Kneel on, on uh, with your right knee. You know, there's a, I, a good question. I, I, it's just a tradition. It's a tradition. <laughs> With a small t. against left-handed people. But, <laughs> yeah. And and Roman Catholics go from left to right, or yeah, left to right, and, left and to right. Eastern Orthodox go from right to left. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> See, kooky Catholic stuff, huh? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Don't know why we just that's what we do. Been doing Look. it for two thousand years. <laughs> so you don't have to kneel. You can show the sign of respect by either kneeling or bowing. Yes, you correct. Don't have to do you do not no it, it it's more common down here in the south than it is up north the the kneeling the so sign of the cross yeah that's fine that, they're all signs of devotion. yeah nothing's wrong right it's uh 
you know, it's sometimes I think people forget and they, they just get so you know it's just a habit that they do it. Mm -hmm. And like the other day, I got asked by a person in uh, my family that was like, "Why, why do we do the cross before mm -hmm. it gets in the uh, scripture again?" I, I oh, oh, right, you know, yeah, the gospel. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Everybody get what are you saying? Yeah. Penny, did you get that? Explain that. That's a good point. No, the the little sign of the cross on your forehead, on your mouth, and over your heart, so that the word of God will be in your mind, on your lips, and in your heart. Uh, that you will love the word of God and try to live by it, and that you will speak the word of God. And that you will always be thinking about the word of God. So if you're Even not the priest or what, deacon be, before he, he uh, before he reads the gospel, he'll say, Go ahead. Cleanse my heart and my lips, O Lord, as you cleanse the mouth of Isaiah with the burning coal, then I may proclaim the gospel worthily through Christ our Lord. Amen. So he says that before he reads the gospel. Was that Penny or Brittany that had a question? That was Penny. Right, so if you're not Catholic yet, at what point do you make the sign of the cross and you, do you start doing that? Or, yeah. yeah. I'd start right away. You're going to be doing it as a Catholic, God willing, once you enter the church. So start right away, get used to it. Let it become a habit as it has for many of us mm -hmm. uh, who were baptized Catholic. See, and you guys have the advantage. So you, you, you know the reason why. And most of the rest right. of us were just because mama said. Mm -hmm. So if you really believe that Christ is present in the tabernacle and every time you pass it, you acknowledge the king, it doesn't matter if you're already received uh, full communion into the Catholic mm -hmm. church or not. Mm -hmm. um, that's what you believe. And that's what you're acknowledging. And that's what you're praying you know, these are sacramentals. These are things that we do that bring us closer to God, whereas sacraments impart grace. Um, and so anybody that's, you know, Catholic or not Catholic, if that's what you believe, then, uh, yeah, you should, you should do it. I, um, I don't know what those guys believe now when they make a touchdown and they make the sign of the cross and point up, but <laughs> if those guys are Catholic or not, but um I don't know what what they're trying to say, but <laughs> I take it as a good thing, but I'm not sure. <laughs> it's like it's like that story they, they tell about, maybe you've seen it too, in baseball, that before the guy gets up to the, the bat, he'll make the sign of the cross. And so a, a Protestant was sitting in the stands and he said, he said, I'm not Catholic, but what does that mean? If, uh, what, what does that mean when the, when the guy gets up to the bat and he, and he goes like this. And the Catholic says, if he hasn't been to batting practice, it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Um, let me share a screen here. Uh, but, 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 um, Catholic prayers. Jade, can you see the screen with the common Catholic prayers? Yes, I can. Okay, cool. Thanks. Yeah. You'll see it in New Orleans <laughs> frequently. People um, walk by a church and make the sign. Well, so I did what a good catechist does. Um, I Googled common Catholic prayers, <laughs> and this is what we got. Uh, obviously, the Our Father and the Hail Mary, um, and we'll talk a lot about Hail Mary when we do the uh, How to Pray the Rosary, but this prayer comes right out of Scripture. And the Glory Be, which Father shared with us a few times um, this year, and you see the Apostles' Creed. Um, Hail Holy Queen, we say it now with the Rosary. Um, yeah, Mona Christi. Uh, that's a nice one. May come back. To that I'm trying to get down to the prayer before the meal. <laughs> um, yeah, these are common Catholic prayers. You see there the Saint Michael prayer that we've been praying at Mass here at Saint John. Act of contrition, which you say at uh, reconciliation. Um, Is that change that? Act of contrition. Yes. 
because I know the professional, uh, I read it one time, and it wasn't the same one I, no. I was taught. No, they've changed it a couple times. And uh, you can say any act of contrition you want to, in any language you want to. And if you don't know any, you just make up your own. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But they did change it. It's not the one I learned. Yeah, I noticed that I went to read it one time. Like this, this right. is what I went to call it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, not many prayers. There's not many prayers you have to you have to know to be Catholic, but if there are any, it's the grace before meals, right? Bless us, O Lord, and these thy gifts which we are about to receive from thy bounty, through from thy bounty through Christ our Lord. Amen. Um, and, and, you know, so we would just say it real fast and, uh, and, uh, dig in. <laughs> I grew up in a family of, uh, seven kids and, and mom and dad and dad had first dig into the, into the big pot. So, uh, you know, get through the prayer and get to the meal. But, um, and I, I think I mentioned to y'all, my daughter used to say, um, and these thy guests, bless us, O Lord, and these thy guests instead of gifts and we we weren't paying attention we never actually realized it she was a little older but um what a neat little prayer though uh we talked about blessings last week and then we start off this prayer bless us oh lord you know just that as you sit down as a family and you really should in these busy times especially uh sit down as a family to eat a meal um and as a family, ask for blessing. Uh, and then, and these are gifts, um, acknowledging that everything is from God, uh, which we are about to receive from thy bounty. You know, uh, God provides, and he provides in, in plentifulness. Um, and then we always pray through Christ our Lord. Uh, amen. Uh, you know, the great amen, I believe. Um, uh, so what, what a cute little beautiful, impactful, simple, wonderful little prayer that is. Um, does y'all have family prayers before meals growing up? Did you? Still do. Mm -hmm. Still do? It depends. Sometimes it is. I don't know. Mm-hmm. You did the God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for this week. Look out teeth, look out gums here, look out stomach, here it comes. <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> yeah, yay, yay, God. At least you got a little gaudy stuff in there. <laughs> I like it. Yeah, I was more thankful for the food as opposed to you know, the normal thing we say is that out. Yeah, cool. I don't know, kind of a Catholic thing. I, I don't, I don't know that if it's if non-Catholics pray that same in any fashion. But um, I don't know. That's the way we do it. Uh, and then there, but there is a grace after meals. Not a lot of people do that. We give thee thanks for all thy benefits, Almighty God, who livest and uh, reignest with well, I heard, without end. Amen. May the souls of the faithful departed through the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen. And, um, you know, pray it slow when you think about maybe family members who have passed or whatever. Um, so it's a beautiful little family prayer. You know, the family is the domestic church. Society relies on strong families. And so as Catholics, we must stick up for that. And we, one of the many ways we can put it in practice, simple way, is to insist that you will eat meals as often as possible uh, as a family. Um, you know, like I said, we had seven kids, but you were expected to be at table. And with that many kids, you were expected to help clean up the dishes too. Um, so yeah, common Catholic prayers. Um, and then there's this uh, guardian angel prayer. Those are the three I really wanted to. Uh, so, and I remember, like I said, as, as a little kid, my mom, praying this with us, um, you know, every night. Angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom God's love commits me here, ever this day or night, be at my side, to light and guard,
to rule and guide. Amen. Um, so comforting little prayer. Did y'all have nighttime prayers that you prayed? That one? Okay. Who else? Penny or Jade or Brittany? Just throw one in there. Grew up Baptist. We prayed for everything. <laughs> <laughs> kind of how we were we didn't we have a set prayer that we said every night yeah um but we were encouraged to pray but it wasn't a set prayer that we said mm -hmm. yeah well and, and then we uh, always did now Lainey. yeah <laughs> then afterwards mom would you know let us pray for who do you want to pray for uncle bob uncle jim aunt bev pray for teacher pray for who be my friend pray and then i guess the spirit would descend upon my mom and come out in a great sigh and that was time <laughs> that was really the signal for that's enough <laughs> I'm tired too I want to go to bed so uh but you know those are special times special times of prayer um any of these you want to talk about father well that, that old saying from father Peyton the family that prays together stays together there's a lot of truth in that. Uh, he was promoting the rosary, but any kind of prayer, the prayer before, after meals, special opportunities, birthdays, anniversaries, any excuse you can find to pray together as a family, it's a good thing. It will hold you together like glue. My uh, sister and, and her husband <clears throat> with their kids, they would well when we did it as kids mom we would be already be in bed and she would come to our bedside and, and we'd pray together of course there's three or four of us in one room so she's catch catch us like that but my sister and her husband would take the kids and they would gather in the living room make a little circle and and hold hands and um and so the times we we spent a lot of you know vacation times with them and it was very sweet the way they did, especially when their kids were little bitty and uh Poor little cherubs, they, they couldn't think of anything to pray for when they were on the spot. Um, I don't know who to pray for. <laughs> but, you know, and it, but it was a loving time and a, and a sweet time. So family traditions, um, that's where you learn, right? In the family, you learn how to mess up and it's okay. You know, um, so cool. Um, so Catholic prayers. Catholic prayers come in lots of different uh, shapes and sizes. Um, and it's more like uh, toppings on the dessert, right? The more you, the more you learn. And I thought I had a stash of little blue books, but Darren and I couldn't find them. So I'll order some more and get those in your hand. It's a nice little book to have at your, uh, at your bedside. And, um, and, um, you know, Catholic prayers to have handy. Let's see, I want to get out of the screen here. Um, uh, don't have my technical. Oops. Well, I'm just messing this up. Um, but let's talk a little bit about uh, artwork, uh, art and uh, in all its different forms. Um, um, Catholic uh, tradition has a lot of, um, a lot, like if you went to Rome or you went to uh, uh, different places and saw and even the church buildings themselves, not only in Rome, but uh, everywhere, um, the different sorts of, of artwork. Um, and I'm just transfixed on getting this back online here. Did we lose the Zoom people? No, I didn't close it. I just <laughs> fumbled around as to how to put the screen back on. Ah, here we go. Stop share. There we go. Ah, there y'all are. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, but art comes in many different varieties, um, uh, books 
and uh, sculpture, uh, artwork, and that sort of thing. Um, and they are, they're all uh, beautiful and they, and they lift our prayers. Uh, <clears throat> you've been around a bit, Father, with some of the, some of the beautiful uh, uh, works of art that, 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 that you've seen around. Well, I guess the earliest Christian art is to be found in the catacombs in Rome where the martyrs were buried and then uh, the Christians would go in and honor the, uh, the martyrs by drawing pictures on the walls of the tombs. And uh, they are the various works of art. Uh, some Madonnas are attributed to St. Luke. St. Luke we know for sure was a physician but there's a tradition that he was also an artist and did what we call today icons, uh, of, especially of Mary holding the child Jesus. Whether he did that or not, I don't know. Uh, could have been something painted over, a sketch that he did, we don't know for sure. But the icons are maybe the earliest forms of Christian art after the catacombs. And then once, uh, Christianity became legal, thanks to Constantine. Uh, then a lot of um, churches and basilicas were built and they were decorated with mosaics. That was another form of early Christian art. And the subject was usually Jesus himself or, G uh, or Mary holding Jesus and uh, scenes from Jesus' life. So some of those basilicas go back to the fourth century, fourth and fifth century, and they are truly Christian art right from the beginning. Uh, and then art developed as music does, the same way with music. All of these things are to draw you into the life of Jesus, into the mystery of, of what he accomplished by his life, death, and resurrection. Um, so when you go to churches in, in, uh, in Europe, they're magnificent. The ones that weren't, I was gonna say, that weren't bombed in World War II, but even those that were have been restored. Like uh, Monte Cassino, I, I don't know if you're familiar with Monte Cassino, it was a, a Benedictine monastery where the Benedictines, right from early times, built the monastery and decorated. Well, World War II, uh, I don't know whose planes, whether they were ours or English or I don't know, but they bombed it. And uh, uh, then after the war was over, the monks went back and they restored it uh, beautifully, just like it was in, in the beginning. Uh, I remember taking a group there one time and we got off the bus to go into the monastery. And the lady, one of the ladies was disappointed. She said, I thought we were going to a casino. I said, no, it's called Monte Casino, Casino Mountain, where the Benedictines have been for centuries. <laughs> she couldn't go home. <laughs> but, uh, but that's where you find a lot of fantastic art, Christian art in, in the monasteries. Yeah, and the Father says you, you, that's to uh, help. That is a prayer, you know, to uh, to gaze upon beautiful art, works of art, and um, and let it lift your prayer. Uh, and it's nice to have uh, Catholic Christian art in your in your home. Um, I know a wedding present we were given a, a crucifix, and it's the the one that you know comes apart and has the holy water and the candle right. for a sick call. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, encourage you to put, uh, uh, artwork in your, in your home. Um, the Missalette, of course, um, has lots of, uh, prayer opportunities of scooching this in so my buddies can see. Uh, this is Sacred Heart, but it's a particular artist rendition. It looks a little, kind of a Spanish flavor there. Um, and I'll, I'll pass it around there, but, um, you know, so... Don't just pick up the missile and look for the thing. Come a little early, you know, use this kind of stuff for your prayers. And I, I'll, I'll mention too, while we got the uh, missile out 
on the back of Mr. Latin, usually on the inside cover uh, in the back are um, some common uh, prayers. It's some of the ones we talked about a minute ago are, are on there. So it's nice to get to mass, get to church a little early and maybe use some of these prayers to, to help you along. And, um, and then the songs. Uh, so beautiful, you know, um, uh, songs of, of, uh, of our Catholic uh, tradition. Um, and it's good to learn the words to the songs and so that you can sing along. But uh, uh, now thank thee all our God. Um, just want to redline circle because I, I love that song. But if you take the time and read the words, um, it's like uh, popular culture songs you know, and they rock and roll or whatever it is. But if you look at the words, then you get the meaning of what the artist intended for that song, other than the, the music is pretty and lyrical and all that, but it's the words that matter. Now thank thee all our God with heart and hands and voices whose wondrous deeds hath done in whom his world rejoices. What beautiful poetry, what beautiful poetry it is. Oftentimes our Catholic songs are right out of scripture and other times not. Uh, so use the missalette as prayer, read the words of the songs and sing to God. Um, if you have a croaking voice, just croak, but do what you do and uh, give praise to God. That's prayer. That's a form of prayer. Um, Sorry, there's no the I know it. Well, we won't have COVID forever. Darren, would you pass that yeah, around a little bit? Especially if you go to 7 o'clock mass, apparently, if you do a lot of bad voices, there's no going to get you to birds. <laughs> but there's no choir, 7 o'clock mass. It's very quiet at 7 o'clock mass. Kind of like the, the old side class, never really <laughs> So, oh, and one of the most beautiful books that has beautiful art is is the um, the book of the Gospels has usually has pretty uh, pictures in it, and then um, the liturgy book with the liturgy in it is is quite beautiful. Uh, Check the date on the front cover. It's about three years old. Yeah, I, I got a stash one year when they <clears throat> rolled out and I put them in the box so we could use them here. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's another form of different forms of prayer, liturgy, devotions, adoration, spiritual guides. We talked about the uh, what those are uh, last time, but um, I wanted to dive a little bit deeper tonight into the Catholic um, uh, tradition of these things. Um and, I, you know, um, I think we had a class on the Mass uh, a few months ago uh, that was, uh, you know, we went through the Mass, just the, the, part, the, the, the parts of the Mass and that sort of thing. Um, but the words, the prayer of Mass, Father, um, are, so, are so beautiful. Uh, of course, the Eucharistic prayer is so triumphant. Um, it tells the story of Christianity, doesn't it? Seems to be. Uh, maybe you could explain that a little. Well, bit I mean, more. I mean, uh, you know, it just sort of tells the story of um, of Christ's uh, um, gift to the world of his uh, of his sacrifice and his triumph. Right. Um, it, it's so uplifting. I find. Yeah. Right. Okay. I see. I see what you mean. It does uh, because of the readings. Actually, there are three parts to the uh, to the mass. I think we probably mm -hmm. went over that. But the first part, the liturgy of, of the word, which is going to cover the Old Testament and the New Testament. So that, yes, that's part of Christ's life and the gospel, definitely. Um, but also the life of the early church in the letters from St. Paul or one of the other letters. And then a reading from the Old Testament to start off with. Then after the liturgy of the word comes the preparation of the gifts. So the main focus is on Christ offering of himself to the heavenly father. That is the really the main focus of the mass is on the father. 
people think they're going to, to mass to receive Jesus and it's all about Jesus. It's about Jesus' relationship with the Father. That's what it's all about. And so when once the gifts have been prepared, then you get ready for the sacrifice. It's the holy sacrifice of the mass. Um, after Vatican II, there was an emphasis on the mass as a meal. It's more than a meal. Yes, it's bread and wine prepared to be offered. But that bread and wine becomes the body and blood of Jesus. And he offers himself once again, eternally, to the heavenly father. That's what it's. And then the father gives Jesus back to us under the form of bread and wine, which we receive at Holy Communion. And then after that part of the mass, then we, we slowly come to an end. So everything around that highlights what the mass is. You mentioned music, uh, the artwork. You have beautiful stained glass windows here at St. John's. They came from another church, but they're old and they're beautiful. And you have to remember that uh, when they had these things in the churches of Europe, most of the people were illiterate. They couldn't read. And, and so the, uh, when they went to church, they saw the whole life of Christ in the stained glass windows, in mosaics, in icons. And that's how uh, the, the, the religion was passed on from one generation to another. So when you walk into the Catholic Church, the beauty just surrounded you and you were drawn into listening to the word of God. They couldn't read or write, but they could memorize. They could memorize hymns and uh, they could memorize what they saw in the windows and so forth. So um, to be aware of what's happening around us, uh, the environment, of, of every church speaks to us. And when we go in, then to be aware also, first part, liturgy of the word, second part, liturgy of the Eucharist. And then the fellowship that we have there too, Jesus is not only in the, in the Eucharist, he's in the community as we come together. And that's why many churches have, like you do, what they call a gathering space, either before or after, no talking once you get into the church, the main body of the church. But before and after, fine, to experience the fellowship that we have as fellow Catholics. It seems to me that the, the, um, the Mass is the most perfect of prayer. It is. It I mean, is. We, we come in and, and we acknowledge our sins. Right. And then we uh, celebrate the risen uh, Christ. And then we are sent to go and do Correct. Uh, the work of God. And that's, that's how we should pray. Mm -hmm. um, Father, forgive me, I'm a sinner. I, thank you for saving me. Uh, I just wanna do your will. You know, that's, that's a perfect prayer squished down into a few words. And that's what we do in mass. Mm -hmm. We do the same thing. It's mass is the most perfect of prayers. Mm -hmm. I, I, mm -hmm. I feel like, yeah. Um, and so we have, you know, the liturgy and uh, it unfolds, uh, you know, every Sunday uh, at mass, but also for things like baptisms and weddings and, uh, you know, the other sacraments, uh, you know, we have liturgy that, that goes along with it, prayer, beautiful words, beautiful words of baptism are some of the most beautiful words as well. Um, how did all that, where did that come from? <laughs> oh started with the apostles. Um, and, and you can read in the Acts of the Apostles where it says the community came together for the prayers and the readings and the breaking of the bread. The breaking of the bread is probably the oldest uh, description of the Eucharist, of Holy Communion. It goes back to the story of the road to Emmaus where the disciples recognized Jesus in the breaking of the bread. And that's that's what it's, it, it all started back then when the community came together uh, on, on Sunday. The rest of the Jews were in the, in the uh, synagogue on Saturday. From sundown Friday to sundown Saturday was their Sabbath. That was their uh, Sabbath day. 
But then after Jesus rose from the dead, we say, first day of the week is Sunday. This is the most important day of the week, his resurrection. That's what we're celebrating. So for us as Christians, we celebrate Sunday, whereas our Jewish brothers and sisters celebrate Sabbath on Friday night and then uh, a Saturday morning. When did that come, come into play? What? That would be around seven, uh, um, maybe before 70 AD, uh, shortly after Jesus' death and resurrection, which would be 33. I'd, I'd say around 40, 40, 50 AD. Uh, once they began to form as a community, then they would meet together uh, in somebody's house. There were no churches. They were, they were house churches. And that's where they... Uh, that's where they would share the readings. They, they were literally letters that came from St. Paul to, let's say, the town of Ephesus. And so the, the first people you had were the leaders, and he would be like our present-day bishop. And then you had deacons, like St. Stephen, the deacon, and other uh, men who were chosen to minister to the poor, to widows, and orphans. And um, so the, the, the bishop and the deacons came together in somebody's house. Then as the church grew and became a little more rural, in, in the beginnings, uh, the, the church was urban. It was urban. But as it grew and people moved into the suburbs, you needed someone to minister to them. That's where priests came along. And so the, the bishop would do, ordain men to, uh, to preach and to uh, administer the sacrament of the Eucharist. So in the beginning, that was the structure. If people tell you, oh, I don't believe in organized religion. Well, come on, give me a break. The church was organized from the very beginning by Jesus Christ and the apostles. There's no such thing as an unorganized church. And, uh, and you can't do it on your own. Religion is a communal experience. But right, uh, but right in the first century, that's when it started. So why did the Jewish, they never, they just stay steady the whole thing in today? Yes, that is correct. Some converted, some converted to, uh, uh, to become followers of Jesus. The early church, the church of Jerusalem was totally Jewish. And it wasn't until St. Paul and, and Timothy and Barnabas started reaching out to Gentiles. And the Jews didn't like that. The, the, they figure these Gentile people who are not Jewish, they don't belong in our group. And they had to, they had to form a, the Council of Jerusalem to decide, yes, they are welcome. The Holy Spirit came down upon them. What more proof do you need that they're acceptable? And from there on, it just took off. Among the Gentiles and a very few Jews followed. The Jews were looking for a Messiah that was kind of temporal, would come in, get rid of the Romans, establish uh, some kind of uh, a peace on earth where everybody would live together in harmony. We'd all be rich, nobody oppressing us. That, that just didn't happen. Hasn't happened yet. Some are still looking for that. Cool. Question. This is more of a practical nature question. The, the early Catholics, yes, followers, did, were they still Jewish and that they celebrated the Sabbath also? No, they didn't. Uh, when they became Christian, and in the beginning, they were all Catholic. Let's put it that way. There was only one denomination. Uh, first, they were, they were known as Christians in Antioch. They were known as, before that, they were called the followers of the way because Jesus said he was the way, the truth, and the life. So the very first term for uh, Christianity and Catholicism was the way. Then they were known as Christians. After Christians, they became known as Catholic. As the religion spread, Catholic meaning universal, and as it spread, then they took on the, the name Catholic. I just was thinking on a, on a very practical note that I can totally see like those, like the coming outlaw that eventually 
Saturday and then the Catholic. Oh, did y'all hear online? Did y'all hear what she said? She said that maybe they, they held on to some of their Jewish roots and, and did the Sabbath on Saturday and the and the Christian uh, gathering on Sunday. But they were they were kind of so so Catholic means universal? Yes. I never knew that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But to go back to your, your question, little by little, they eliminated things that were Jewish, like circumcision. Uh, the, the Jews, and even the Jewish followers of Jesus first insisted that if a convert comes over, he has to be circumcised. And they had a big argument about that. And finally, they decided, no, that's not necessary. So little by little, they pulled away from their Jewish roots and took on a whole new identity as Christians. Awesome. Uh, good, good, good talks. More questions? We do this all night. That's, <laughs> this is the fun part. Um, yeah, so let's talk a little bit about devotions a little bit deeper than we did last time. Uh, and we have the um, consecration with uh, St. Joseph. What's the date in the parish? On the February 15th, I think we kick off 33 days uh, prayer to St. Joseph. I think I gave out these cards before um, with the St. Joseph prayer on it. Yeah, so little cards like that. And um, here's one. Well, it just has the Apostles' Creed on it. But again, beautiful artwork uh, and beautiful words. These are all prayers, you know, that lift our... Uh, lift our spirits to God. Um, I raided the uh, CCD office. Forgot about this one. Here's a consecration to the Holy Family. What a pretty picture that is. Uh, Darren, you want to pass those around? Um, with the uh, Holy Family. Uh, and if y'all didn't hear, we have another little St. Joseph in my family. Little grandson was born uh, last mm -hmm. night, Colin Joseph Perkins, another little St. Joseph in the world. The world can always use more Josephs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, mama and baby doing great. Um, and there's a, uh, you know, a litany here of, of prayer to, uh, to Lord Jesus, to Blessed Mary, to St. Joseph, uh, and to the Holy Family. It's a consecration, something a family can say together or uh, the leader of the family can say for the family. Um, so this stuff is like scattered around for you to just have to pick up for free. I, I found these in the hallway in there on the way to the bathroom. Uh, the CCD office had them on display, but usually behind it, in the back of church, you know, there's stuff laying around. Grab it, man, and, and have, it in the, have it in the family and um, um, expose your kids to it and, um, you know, make it a, make it a devotion. A pretty, pretty little picture. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay, the way of the cross. Uh, <clears throat> is that a devotion or is that a liturgy or is that, you know, what bucket do we put it in? And more fun though, what is it? <laughs> are, are you familiar with the way of the cross that we do at, during Lent? Some yes, some, some no. Some yes, some no. Give it okay. a big shake. <laughs> uh, it was, it was developed, I think, by St. Francis of Assisi, uh, who was also the one who founded the Christmas crib. Um, he was a tremendous saint, and he wanted to make the life of Jesus uh, available to everyone in, in ways that they would never forget, like the nativity scene. That was a, he used live people, and it's the same way with the Stations of the Cross. So there are 14 stations that you find in Jerusalem. Now, after 2000 years, we can only guess those 14 steps that, well, the 14, we call them stations. Uh, uh, how can we put it? 14 places in the life of Jesus, passion and death, where you can stop, and reflect on what happened there right from the very beginning when he was condemned to death. If you go into the Adoration Chapel and you go into the church, there are the Stations of the Cross, 14 of them. And you start with uh, Jesus is condemned to death. 
And then you follow the different places where, uh, let's say, for example, he falls the first time. You go to where Simon of Cyrene helps him carry the cross. You go to where Veronica wipes his face. Now, some of these things are not in scripture. Uh, these are devotions, as Joey said, and they've been developed through the years. Um, I think those who are, came from a Baptist or Protestant background would object because there's no place in, in scripture that talks about Veronica, about a woman who went up to Jesus and with her veil wiped it his face, and it left the imprint of his face on the veil. Well, that never appealed to uh, Lutherans and other Protestants right from the beginning of the Reformation. As a matter of fact, when they took over many churches in Germany, they, they took down the stations and threw them away. They did the same with relics, stained glass windows, statues. Uh, they wanted to return to the purity, of the early church. And uh, still that way with many Protestant churches, you don't see stained glass windows with images um, and you don't see statues and, and holy pictures and so forth. And that's their privilege, um, but we do. And St. Francis did. So he developed these 14 ways, it's called the way of the cross, 14 stations where you stop before one of the stations. Let's say, for example, Jesus meets his mother on, uh, on the way to the cross. Well, you stop and think about not only his sorrow, not only his suffering, but think about the suffering of Mary and uh, why she is called the sorrowful mother before Jesus died and after he died and was taken down from the cross and placed in her arms. So you, you would just stop there and, and think and pray about that. And during the, the course of the centuries, the church has developed artwork. And you talk about beautiful artwork, the Pieta, the famous Pieta in Rome by Michelangelo, where Jesus is in the arms of his mother after having been taken down from the cross. Famous artwork through the centuries, but, it, but we owe it all uh, at least with the stations, to St. Francis of Assisi, who got that idea. And even today, in, in uh, the Passion Play in Oberammergau, in Bavaria, uh, the local people from that village of Oberammergau act out the Passion. It's a, it's a theatrical production that takes all day, and uh, from morning to night. And it's, it's all acted out. That's the idea that Francis had. And it's something that, that you never forget. So I don't, that's yeah, a, yeah, it's a beautiful devotion. And, uh, you know, mom would bring us, uh, you know, all seven kids in. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, uh, stand up, kneel, sit down, you know, the calisthenics and, uh, uh, you know, and mumbling the, the words. And, you know, we didn't know what was going on. Uh, so, you know, try to make it a point with your kids to walk the stations, you know, uh, hang out after mass or come after a little bit early, more like probably hang out afterwards, trying to get kids to, to church at all, much less early is a bit of a challenge, but take the time to bring your kids around to see the, that artwork, the stations, each one, see them up close um, and, you know, makes it more, makes it more personal. I have a question um, about this. Like with Michelangelo, revered, he was revered in his time, you know, as an artist. Right. How come we don't have artists today in recent in recent time that develop artwork related to Christianity that's gotten to the point to where a lot of these other things are that are so old? Yeah. Like, I don't know. I think I mean, some I mean, of the it's just everything is that is really, really nice. It's all old. There's, it's like it never it didn't continue. <laughs> that's, that's, well, that's strange, isn't it? Well, I think some of the, I, I know the uh, cathedrals, uh, especially out east, are, are beautiful architectural works of art. Um, um, I don't know. Sometimes uh, uh, timeless art needs a little time under its wings to become timeless. You know what I mean? Some of this stuff's been around 500 years, 700, 800 years. So, 
it stood the test of time. So maybe there is a, you know, a timeless piece that's just getting made today. <laughs> well, it's so, nobody, you know, nobody, oh, man, you got to go look at this. It might be, you know, back then, the, the Catholic Church was, Patrons of artists and stuff. Good and point. Good she point. Said, that's mm. that's exactly. She what said uh, back then there were patrons who uh, who dedicated uh, funding to uh, artists to, yeah. to create some of the stuff. Yeah, that's that's an excellent point because you had not only the popes were patrons of the arts, but also kings, dukes, uh, anybody who had lots of money. And they wanted to build a church in memory of themselves and their family. Uh, they would pour money out for music. Mozart made a lot of his money by writing music for the, the Archduke of Vienna. So uh, you, you had a lot of people back then who had plenty of money and they were known as the patrons of the arts. Today, we don't have, what do we have today? Starving artists. So a starving artist can become famous through the years um, if he's good enough. But your point is that there's not enough to see. There is one talking about the Pietà of Michelangelo. There's an artist whose statue is at the University of Notre Dame in Indiana. And um, I forget his name. He also did the one in New Orleans of the woman at the well it's in front of the uh, Notre Dame Seminary. But anyhow, he did a piece that was Jesus in the arms of God the Father. Mm. Instead of Mary, he's in the arm, the Heavenly Father has him in his arms. It's a magnificent piece. But, but you're right, they're rare. They're rare, beautiful. But the same thing has happened to music and to art. And um, it's just unfortunate. The beauty is not there. And you find God in beauty, not in disorder. You've seen modern art. And, and they say even the monkeys could do better than that. You could <laughs> put uh, a paint on their, their hands and they'll go over the canvas. It's awful. There's nothing there that's, that's beautiful. But real beauty leads you into the divine, whether it's a building or a mosaics or or whatever, music, whatever, but we don't have it. It's a shame. We do not have it. You just think of what, what, what went up in, in the Vatican for Christmas. Well, I just think <laughs> about the money that these are. And all these guys have, and they can throw it around on whatever they want. And well, and I think a good example is like you mentioned our uh, high altar. Yeah. You know, that's two, three hundred years old, some of it, um, some of it about a hundred years old, but you know, uh, that wasn't paid for by Jeff Bezos or those kinds of people. Those were paid for by folks, families like right. you and I, as working class folks who gave right. of not of their extra, but of some of their need um, and went in to create something so beautiful, so timeless that we just had to have it uh, for our community. That's what it takes. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what it takes is us. Mm -hmm. us supporting those things even within our families i mean how many families today support a, a child who wants to serve in the religious life mama oh, daddy i want to be a nun i want to be a priest oh no most of the families say why would you throw your life away you could have a family you could do this and that <laughs> wrong answer you know what are we giving back to god when's the last religious or priests that's come out of the community here in Zachary. There ain't one. <laughs> there ain't one. Uh, so point the fingers at ourselves. You know, we, we have to be the wellspring uh, to support the uh, support these things. So I got a question. So like what's Zachary? Or was it 20,000 20, people you're saying? About that. And the Felicianus, I'm, I'm sure it's another 30 total. But is that is that that we're doing something wrong to not have a have put some a, a priest in after all these years? Well, it ain't working, so we're doing something not right. I don't know. Wrong, you're stealing, but, uh... you're stealing my sermon for Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems that way. Yes, it you're right. Do the same thing. Yeah, it's more of a sin of omission. 
but the, the readings for Sunday are, are very applicable to just what you're talking about, the vocation. It, it's not vocation Sunday, but the readings lend themselves to a talk on vocation. And I'll address that on Sunday, if I have a mask. Father Chuck is gonna be back, so maybe he and Father Jeff will, will take the. I have the uh, vigil on, um, on Saturday. On Saturday. Mm -hmm. I'll be at the vigil. Well, you'll hear my sermon. And you can let him know what it was. <laughs> What's the percentage, or do y'all know, like as far as in this area that we're talking about, uh, denomination-wise, what percentage do Catholics have of it? Oh man, I used to know that when I first started. I kind of looked it up. It's, it's the largest uh, religion in the world. Yeah, but I'm not here. In here, where in the week. In the it's, it's not as great oh. as it used to be. <laughs> it no. used to be about 80%, I think, but it's somewhat close to 50%, I think. And, uh, north of uh, I-10, the numbers of Catholics drop precipitously. <laughs> yeah. Get back in the Cajun country, you know, it flips. I, I, you know, I'm thinking about what, we just, what I was just asking you about. Well, I think it all starts in such an early age, what you see, and of course I'm here, I am, trying to be a Catholic, or converting, but when you don't have the fundamentals early on, like a true Catholic school where your nuns are there right. and starting from an early age, and that's what the expect expectation is for a kid that's in kindergarten, four or five, and to continue on by the time he gets to be 17 or 18 to have, you know, a good 12, 13 years worth of, uh, that's right. Mm -hmm. That's very true. That is very true. I know in my life, it was the nuns who encouraged me in elementary school. Then when I got to high school, that was a different situation. And college the same way. But ultimately, after college, I did answer the call. And uh, today, what happens when kids go to college? I mentioned that last week. I was surprised nobody got up and walked out. But uh, even for Catholic colleges, do you get the truth about the Catholic Church in a Catholic college? Maybe 12 out of all the Catholic colleges in this country. Will you get the truth about the faith? The others are just like any other college or university in the country. And, and it's, the faith is not encouraged. Anymore. We have Newman Centers and, and Catholic campus ministries and so forth. They handle a small percentage. Less than 1% of the Catholic kids go there on Sunday. Less than 1%. And most kids lose their faith when they're in college, even Catholic colleges. So where are you going to get the vocations? You don't have the kids, first of all. The average family is, what, two or three kids? In the old days, you had seven, five, uh, nine. I'll talk about in the sermon, 11, 12, 13. And they all went. They all went to the priesthood and religious life in one family, family of my, my founder of the Josephites. Um, but the people were anxious to give their children to God, like you were saying about that's, that's gone, this whole idea of giving a, one of my children to God, just one, not all 11, but just one. But that, that mentality is not there. Not We've lost it. I do. do you have any suggestions on how to bring it back? <laughs> you're right, it starts in the family. Then if you're lucky, a Catholic school. Um, and if you're lucky, Catholic friends who support yeah, you. I just don't think you can stumble your way into it. You cannot. No, you cannot. It happens rarely. You think of someone like um, uh, Avery Dulles who became a Jesuit. His father was very famous, John Foster Dulles. You remember John Foster Dulles. He was uh, Secretary of State. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, not Catholic. And he got upset when his son became a Jesuit. And there were others as well. Uh, they, they didn't stumble in, in, in this. I don't know what, him, what brought him into the Catholic faith, but he upset the whole family when he became Catholic. And many, many, uh, even saints had, had that situation. I, I like that part about stumbling into the faith. God doesn't allow you to stumble into the faith. It's part of his plan. But they're the exception. They are the exception.
Good, good, good discussion. So whenever, Any... whenever, in an area like this, uh -huh. just say, I would imagine that the, the road starts probably at 12, you're probably gonna be close to a path by then, right? Yeah. It's probably pre-puberty or so. Right. And you make it there and, and, and someone in 10 years out of our area gets ordained, I guess, uh is there what would a parish like ours how, how big of a celebration is, is, that, is that for a local parish to have your first kid or you know priest i guess it's got to be pretty exciting huh it would be it would be saint isidore uh, had one up yeah. about 11 12 years ago and they're very proud they are very proud where was that at saint isidore and baker oh okay mm -hmm. and then new roads has had plenty we had three in my class come from that genre of Point Capi Parish. I have uh, three classmates who came from there. We were all, they, there were so many, they had to be ordained in that room at the cathedral. Joey, don't we Yeah, yeah, there's like, like been the Mandela, uh, Mandela and, uh, um, um, what's his name? Anyway, yeah, a couple. Yeah, we have a couple. Yeah, we would, we adopted Father Carroll. We did a, we did adopt Father Carroll. But uh, but he's going, he's yeah. going to um, school in Washington D.C. Yeah, yeah. He's, yeah. Just, he's still there, isn't he? Yes, but he's young and he's almost like one of the families here. And uh, he brings a lot of joy into the parish. He does. He um, let's uh, sh sh uh, talk about a couple of little things here, prayers here. Uh, one is um, spiritual guides, spiritual guides. Um, this would be uh, retreats. Uh, some people have personal spiritual directors. Um, uh, there are meditative guides like the Magnificat. I think we talked a little bit about that. Uh, these are these are prayers. These are ways to pray. I guess is probably a better way to put it. Um, and um, lots of opportunities for uh, retreats, uh, men's retreats, women's retreats, uh, couples retreats, uh, a pre cana if you're going to get married. Uh, did you guys do the pre cana already? Uh, yeah, so all that sort of stuff. Um, is that something just kind of wave your hand or whatever that, that over your life, whether Catholic or not, you've taken advantage of retreats, uh, that sort of thing? Uh, I, I, we done before I got married. How was it? It was good. Yeah. Learned a lot. Mm -hmm. Learned a lot? Mm -hmm. A little surprising? No, it wasn't too surprising, but it gets serious. At first, you're kind of thinking about it. Whatever, but then it gets good. Yeah. It's definitely worth it. I enjoyed it. Yeah. After, uh, after it was gone. Yeah, time to, yeah, time to separate, and, you know, from the world a little bit and, and really take time to unwind and listen to God. Thinking of it at that time, talk about some things you didn't really talk about, kind of, you know, just kind of grazed over, but then you really dive deep into it. Yeah, I, I think it's good. I really do. Yeah, I know when Deborah and I were uh, engaged in those days, a uh, popular phrase was marriage is 50 50. Marriage is 50 50. You know, you got to both, you know, do your part. You got to do your role. You got to do your, do your part. And Father Bob Stein was, he, he celebrated the wedding with us and we, he advised us and uh, he said, that's wrong. Marriage is 100 100. And uh, I think it's kind of common to say that now, but in those days, it's like, whoa, you're saying it wrong. <laughs> you know, you got to give 100%, 100% of the time. You know, you got to. Whether you, you like it or you uh, Yeah, whether you like it or don't. So, and that's a little phrase that Deborah and I continued to uh, to say in our in our marriage these 37 years later. Um, you know, that um, it's, it's time to, you got to do your best. You got to give your best. Because uh, mar marriage is a holy institute, so uh, yeah, I, I agree with you, James. You that hundred percent. You say, "Lord, I know you got a plan. <laughs> <laughs> Stay on the track." <laughs> <laughs>
I know you'll make her see that I am right. <laughs> yeah. Um, but um, Manresa, I know, is a retreat uh, avenue for for um, for men. And um, and I think you said you had made a retreat recently. What was that? What was that? Uh, St. Joseph's Advent. It's over there in St. Joseph. Mm -hmm. And what was the name of the retreat? St. Joseph's Advent. Silent retreat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you pick up the uh, commentator magazine for our diocese, you know, they're free to pick up either at the back of church or you can uh, get an electronic copy. It, it flip to the back, there's always a list of retreats that are available. And how long was it? It was a weekend. Have you had five days? And then lunch on Sunday. And uh, Darren and I went to, uh, um, a, it was a Saturday. It was a men's, uh, men's retreat. retreat. It was Men of the Maculata. Thank you, Darren. Um, you know, so these, uh, we had speakers come in from all over the country. And um, of course, there was a mass and a meal and um, very, very powerful, very powerful, um, you know, just the message that men need to be leaders. Um, that's the way we were intended. So um, these things are perpetually available. Just be a, uh, pay attention. Uh, like I said, through the commentators, a good way to to um, stay up on what's what's out there and what's available. But but do it, man. Take the time and um, and, and go do. Um, what other retreats do we have? Um, yeah, I've been looking at that for a couple of years, and uh, yeah, Ro Rosaryville. I don't know if um, Penny had heard of that one. Yeah, I, I saw it online and saw some pictures. Is that you know what we're talking about? Yeah, I've been there many times. Oh, have but you? I don't think they're open during. Oh, uh, yeah, a lot of retreat houses have closed for the COVID. Yeah, but uh, the pictures look beautiful. Oh, the are. grounds must be. Yeah. Yeah, nice. I'd like to do that one. Um, question, question from the group. What? He's asking about the silent retreat. <laughs> Can y'all hear? Um, and once you finish eating, there's no coffee. You have private rooms, and there's prayer. Um, there's where mass is said. There's rosary said. Um, you get up Saturday. Um, so there, there is a schedule. They give lectures, and you you can talk to lecture and like ask questions and stuff. But you're not supposed to talk to each other. And um, just, you can go to anything that you want to go to, or you can stay in your room or go walk around the grounds, whatever you feel. The way man recently. Yeah, lots of lots of different ways. <laughs> lots of different lots of different ways to, lots of different ways to pray, that's for sure. Um Now, okay, last last uh, question uh, is about a spiritual guide or uh, uh, a spiritual uh, director. Okay, spiritual director. What is a spiritual director and how do I get one? <laughs> yeah. uh, there are people who've been trained, lay people, uh, religious brothers and sisters, uh, lay people who've been trained mainly through the... Uh, Lord, teach me to pray group. 
they do a lot of spiritual direction. They're mostly lay people, but they learn from priests and nuns how to give uh, direction to people who want to grow in their faith, uh, mainly in their spiritual life. And what you do, if you find someone uh, who will take you on as a directee, then you plan to meet with that person at least once a month. And then you sit down and you share where you've been spiritually with that individual. And then he or she can help you to grow and see how the Lord is, is moving in your life. And then, uh, and then you pray together and then the person goes back and maybe gets an assignment, things to do uh, over the next month that will help them to grow and overcome some of the difficulties that they're having. So um, that's, that's the role that a, a spiritual director plays. And um, the problem is finding one because with the shortage of priests, uh, a lot of priests just don't have the time to do spiritual direction. Uh, and, and so more and more, we have lay people being trained to give spiritual direction as well as a number of uh, religious sisters. So that's, that's pretty yeah. much it. Yeah, so um, not one way to pray. There's so many different ways to pray and to grow. And, um, and so take advantage. Take advantage. The church offers so much. Um, I like this, uh, talking about artists. Uh, John Michael Talbot is a, um, a musician who um, has got some beautiful uh songs. I wanted to play this one for you. He's a modern contemporary artist. Um, play this song for you. He is a good shepherd. And he's laid down his life for his sheep. So out of many nations, he's gathered one fold in one faith. And he has built his church on the foundation of faith. For apostles and prophets who shepherd the evil in his faith. There is one thing, one more. One baptism, one God, one law. There is one truth, one body, one mind, the spirit God given so free to all. And he gave to the sign, he took to him, to all of the twelve. The keys of the keepers of life shall never be saved. All songs of the church must shoot themselves on this sheep. So he has come out against them and scattered the people they hate. But the sin is one thing, one more, one baptism, one God, one law. There is one church, one body, one mind, and the spirit that feels so free to all. In good and true, he will shepherd in his people. Do not forsake his name. 
He'll play his sheep for his own. He'll send out his word to the nation, we govern its people by the Oh, he is a good shepherd. Slay down his life for his sheep. So while our many nations have gathered one, it was a name. There is one day, one day, one bad day, one cow, one more. There is one church, one day, one day, to the spirit of Jesus, who is one. There is one day, one day, one bad day, one cow, one more. There is one church, one day, one day, to the spirit of Jesus, who is one. That's John Michael Talbot. You can uh, YouTube search for all his songs. You can buy his materials, uh, have good music, you know, uh, available to you wherever you are. So, oops. and he just goes on, doesn't he? <laughs> now there's an icon of oh, Jesus yeah. the Good Shepherd. So that would be one of the early forms of Christian art. Absolutely. Okay. Um, any last questions uh, before we break for the night? Good. Everybody, all my virtual friends, okay? <laughs> All right, well, we'll, we'll just close with a prayer, Father, and we'll move on. Okay. Uh, since this is the year of St. Joseph, you all have a holy card? Okay, let's say the prayer to St. Joseph on the back. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Oh, St. Joseph. You provided a secure and loving home for Jesus and Mary and gave us a model of fatherhood while showing us the dignity of work. We entrust our family to you. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, thank you all. <laughs> Hang on a second. Hang on a second. Okay. I got to think about it.